Thank you so much for tuning in again to another episode of The Next Best Thing. I'm Andrea Klein-Thomas. Today's guest is somebody that I have had the just pleasure of meeting years and years ago when I was super young in the business, and I've just been following her career the entire time, Mara S. Campo. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I can't yes. wait to have this conversation. I feel like these are important conversations to have. Yes. So just your background from the outside looking in, um, that you are an intrepid journalist. And I mean that every sense of the word, right? Like you've always charted your course and your path, um, your past experience. So you were a correspondent at NBC and ABC. More recently, um, you have worked at the Dr. Oz Show and now Revolt Black News. You may have heard her on a podcast. You've done it all. You've, you've crossed so many different platforms. And the first question I always ask people is, how do you describe yourself? This is how we describe you from the outside looking in. But how do you describe yourself? Well, that's a good question. And that really speaks to kind of a question that I have been asking myself over the last few years is separating identity from profession or mm -hmm. from relationships, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I'm what I want to say is I'm a mother. Um, I'm a wife. I'm a journalist. I'm a glam obsessive. Um, <laughs> but is that really me? So there's kind of an existential question there that I that I struggle with. But those are the those are the earthly labels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I met you for the first time um, at uh, NABJ. So it's a Black Journalism Conference in San Diego. And this is, I looked you up. <laughs> like I remember seeing you on NBC and I was like, who is this Black girl? Because they didn't have very many Black people, right? you know? And then I looked you up and I was like, oh, you're from the neighborhood because I grew up in Wheaton, and you know, I didn't. I don't remember that. Wow, yeah, I didn't know that. Okay. I grew up in Wheaton, and I saw you went to Blair, right? Yeah, and my first job was at Wheaton Plaza. It was at the Limited. Okay, so I grew up <laughs> right by the like behind the Wheaton Metro Station. I love that. <laughs> and then, I, and then I went to Maryland for grad school as well. Okay, and I was just like, wait a minute, right? <laughs> like, like, Shout out to the Terps, right? <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, like. I've like I'm I think I'm just uh, just a few years younger than you not much mm -hmm. and then I was just like oh wait I need to figure out who this is she's on network she's so young she's doing all these amazing things and you could not have been nicer mm -hmm. I went to the conference and that was like I need to meet Mara and <laughs> I, I remember meeting I think it was like an elevator or whatever and you stopped and you had your laptop and you watched my tape like right there on the spot like this does not happen you mm -hmm. could not have been nicer. And it just really gave me such great advice at the time. Um, you also helped me like take off my rose colored glasses about what network was like. Yeah, also, I keep, it, I keep it 100 <laughs> uh, all the way. Um, and it's and it's advice that I actually like repeated in my mind, like over and over again, as I was trying to chart my career. But I want to ask you, um, you've just been so proactive in your career since you were really young and saying, because I don't think people really understand that journalism. They're like, you start small and then you do this and then you do that. It's almost like a map that you just yeah. need to hit these notes. And you didn't, that was not your experience. Yeah, no, I had no interest in doing it that way. Yeah. How did you have the confidence even at such a young age to say, no, I'm going to do it a different way, even though you didn't really know how it would turn out? You know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I got 99 problems, but I also know what problems I don't have and, mm -hmm. and the, the ways that, um, you know, my character traits and personality work in my favor. And I've always believed that my life is up to me. I can, I make the rules for what I want for my life. I make the rules for the kind of relationships that I want. I make the rules for the kind of career that I want. You know, I talk to people so often, you know, friends or people that, you know, mentoring and they're like, we create a lot of limitations. It's like, well, I would love to X, but why? And I'm like, well, no, if you want X, then go for X, like at least go for what you want. And then if you fall short, you can deal with that, but don't start by limiting yourself. Right. And so I've always been that way. Um, and, you know, I started trying the traditional way and I had a job in local news and I absolutely hated it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do international work really badly because, you know, I grew up traveling. Um, I lived uh, overseas when I was younger. I was really interested in what was happening in the world at that time. It 
was mm -hmm. right at the height of the um, Iraq war. And so I was like really into that. And I'm like, well, how does one become, you know, a foreign correspondent? And then when I looked at that path, I'm like, I don't want to spend, you know, 10 years in local news before somebody hires me at an organization that actually covers global news. And then that, you know, company will send me to their bureau and wherever. And like, I'm not doing that. I'm, I want to go now. And I know that I have the skills to go now and I'm going to figure it out. Um, and I've always had the confidence in my ability to figure things out. And I think that's actually a very male trait. You see mm -hmm. that in men all the time. All the time. I saw that up close and personal during a renovation where I would come and I would observe the workers. They didn't know how to do half the shit that they were doing. <laughs> they were looking at the manual. They were, but they were confident that they could figure it out and they did. And that is something that I've always had. Like, I may not know what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm going to start. I'm going to be terrible at it when I start and I'm going to figure it out along the way. Um, and so that's what I did. Yeah. Explain to people exactly what you did, how you got your own equipment and flew overseas to start covering stories on your own yeah. dime. So you know this, having gone to the University of Maryland, they yeah. trained us to be one man band reporters. Um, and so I had that skill set from graduate school mm -hmm. where, what does that mean? That means you have, you know, all of your equipment in a small bag and you are the shooter and you are the reporter and you are the writer and you are the producer and you are the editor. You are everything, soup to nuts, one man band. So I knew how to do that. And I also had the benefit of not knowing how it's quote unquote supposed to be done. I did not know what it looked like at the network. And I'm going to get to that in a second. So I thought, well, I, I can do all these things. I should just go do them. And then I can sell these pieces to different outlets. And so that's what I did. I bought um, equipment that was small enough to fit in a carry on bag because I didn't want to check it because I'm like, what if I lose my equipment, you know, when I've checked it. So that was my criteria it had to be small enough to fit in a carry on. And um, I bought pirated editing software off Craigslist and I had to like meet the guy in the street on a corner like it was a drug deal. <laughs> like I gave him the money and he gave me the DVDs to install the Final Cut Pro. And I bought a used laptop mm -hmm. um, and I bought a ticket to Jordan because it was the closest place to the action that felt safe to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I got in touch with a tour guide, um, like a regular tour guide, like he worked for the tour, the tourism bureau, the mm -hmm. tourism department of the country. And I said, you know, can you help me like to get, get like a car if I need it or like take me around and introduce me to people because I knew that I needed someone who spoke the language and was going to keep me safe. Right. And so I went for three weeks and I learned how to to do that as a as a digital correspondent. I didn't know it had a name. I didn't know it was unique. Um, and then when I got to the network, I realized why it was so unique because networks and, and big media is very specialized. You have a producer, a producer probably is working with an associate producer under them. You have a shooter or two, you have an audio person, you have, you know, an editor, you, there's every single job is specialized. Mm -hmm. And I was doing all of them. And I didn't realize that until I got there. And then I was appalled. I'm like, this is slow. There's too many people <laughs> involved. Slow. Like I hate it. And to this day, I do not like to work in big teams. I think it's incredibly inefficient. It's very inefficient. It's very inefficient. Um, when you were leaving um, ABC and you decided, you know, I don't want to be a correspondent anymore. I mean, it, it, it had been so much of your life for so long, you know, and this is what you went to Jordan for, you know, in your twenties to be in this position. Tell me about making that decision of like, I'm just not going to go to another network. I'm not going to get kind of the same job someplace else. How yeah, are you I feeling and what factored into that decision? I knew I was never going to do that job again. Um, I was like, I, I will dig ditches in the summertime. Um, that is more likely than me being a general assignment network correspondent ever again, because I had lost the passion for it. I had lost mm. the love for it. And it is so hard and demanding and draining. It is such a burnout job that if you don't love it, if you're not so excited every day to get out of bed and go do that work, which I was for 10 plus years, mm -hmm. I lived for it. I loved it. I thought I was getting away with something. I'm like, I cannot believe somebody is paying me to do mm -hmm. this job. But 
I got to the point where I didn't. And you can't do that job if you don't have a love for it. Because then what you're trying to do is get out of your job every day. When they're asking you, can you go cover X? And you don't want to go cover X. You're mm-hmm. coming up with excuses. You're, oh, but maybe, uh, like you're praying every day that they'll send someone else. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't <laughs> yeah, work right. for you. It doesn't work for them. It's just, it's not a fit. So I knew I was not going to do that job ever again. The other thing that really turned me off about network contracts is that they're incredibly restrictive. Mm-hmm. So when you are under a network contract, they own you. They own your your voice. They own your intellectual property. If you create something while you're there, which I did, you cannot take it with you. Um, they own, of course, all the work that you do while you're there. Um, there are limits on your social media. There are limits on speaking engagements. And it just seemed to me that that is not how the world works anymore. Right. That people are building these empires with a lot of branches. You know, they have podcasts that they're monetizing. They're monetizing their social media. They're, you know, they have a YouTube channel. They have, you know, this job over here, then they have speaking engagements. And and I was like, no, I want to get on. I want to get in on that game. I want to I want to focus on the future. I don't want to be doing yesterday's game. I want to be playing tomorrow's game. Um, And so I I took a chance um, on myself to see if I could could make that work. Yeah, that's the same thing with local news is that, you know, you can't moonlight in the business at all because it's a perceived conflict of interest. and it was so funny, an earlier episode, I interviewed my brother, who's a VC, and he was getting into the content creation space and getting into the media world. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm the <laughs> one who went to school for this. I'm the one who did the thing. And then here you go on HBO with a huge you know, documentary. Yeah. And I was like, well, wait, that's- I'm, I'm not doing it right. Well, I ha- you know, I have a friend who, um, and I love her dearly, and she she's an interior designer, and mm-hmm. she was like really bitter when you know one day, and she's like, "This is the age of amateurs, and uh, you know all these amateurs are on social media, and they don't know what they're doing, and they don't know anything about design and blah, blah, blah. And I said, "Yeah, but they but they are really good at something that you're not, which is social media. Like that's yeah. a skill that you're completely devaluing and discounting. Um, so I think there is the tendency from a lot of us who trained." you know, and we've, we've gone through the trenches and we've done the work. And then we kind of bristle when we see newcomers who didn't do any of that. And they're wildly successful in that space. They seem like frauds, right? But I never saw it that way. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued because, you know, a lot of people don't like change. I love change. I'm really excited by the way the world moves and and it moves so fast, you know, and and that's always Mm -hmm. been really, exciting to me. And mm-hmm. so when I was seeing, quote unquote, the age of the amateur, I'm like, huh, well, what are they what are they doing? Like, why does this designer who has no experience have 500,000 followers? And this woman who's been on the cover of magazines has 300. So um, that was really exciting to me, too, is trying to figure out how things are changing. And it sounds like that's what, you know, was happening with your brother is that you like you trained, you went to graduate school, you did all the things. And now he's in that space. But there's a lot of freedom there, too, because this really is a time where, you know, if you can conceive it, and you can believe it, you can achieve it. You 100% could. And that's when I was just like, you know, what it was being told to me of what you can and can't do and all that. And I'm like, this is just not true. Right? Like, this is just how it's always been. But this is like, we are way behind the curve. Like, and there's no room, there's no flexibility within the system to try something yeah. new. You know, yeah. there's just, it's just like, this is how we've always done it. And even though people are not tuning in or you're trying to still get people to turn on their TV, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like not what's supposed to be done. But when you said that you were looking at social media, especially, what have you learned um, from those newcomers that you employed that helped you? Um you know, what's interesting when it comes to social media specifically and, and what I've learned from, you know, we're kind of in the age of transparency mm-hmm. and there there are things that I would see people do that I would be like, oh, like you're going to you're gonna show all that. Mm-hmm. But I've learned that like that's re- that's a requirement. That's like the, the, the bar for entry um, mm. for being successful is vulnerability, transparency. And I know people talk a lot about kind of this fake Instagram life, but the people I feel who are most successful at it really are shooting from the hip. Like if you look at the Cardi B's of the world or the AOC who uses Twitter incredibly effectively, um, you, I mean, if they're faking it, they're the best phonies on the planet. You really do get the sense that they're shooting from the hip and they're just putting themselves out there and they're willing to do battle 
Um, and so case in point, you know, I always had this internal conflict between my intense love and passion for glam and journalism, mm -hmm. because I'm a very serious journalist. Anyone who has, you know, is familiar with my work would, would know that. But if you're only familiar with me on social media, you might think that I'm like kind of a frivolous person. And in fact, people will say that in my comments, like, I'm confused. I thought you were a reporter. And I'm like, I can do both. You're right. So, <laughs> That's one of my questions for you is how do you negotiate doing, doing both? Because you're great right. at both. I well, mean, that so that was a big challenge for me internally. I I did not want to show that part of me because it was not aligned with my professional identity, and I was concerned that people would think that I was superficial or vain, and that it would undermine my credibility. And so I never, ever, ever showed it. But everybody in my life who knows me, it like, look, if you're my friend and you're in my house, I'm gonna beg to to paint your face. Like, I'm gonna try to beat your face. Like, that's just me. I'm gonna be like, can I put on two pairs of lashes, please? So everybody who knows me in my life, they know this about me, and mm -hmm. they knew that that was not something that I was showing. There was like an incompatibility there. And so one day I was just like, well, I'm just gonna do it. Like, I don't care. I'm gonna do it because it makes me happy. It brings me joy. And it is authentic to who I am. And I just started posting, and the response has been unreal i'm like up like my tiktok videos are up to like 10 million views um Crazy. it's just it but it for me it's so affirming and confirming that when you follow your joy when you really ask your ancestors and the creator what they want you to do they will lead you to what is for you hmm. Was there a lot of unlearning that had to be done? I struggle. I struggle in this space. Like I really, really do. Um, because I didn't realize how trained I was in some things, you know, Absolutely. and how rigid I was in the training because it was all around me. And now that I've removed myself from it, I'm seeing ways in which I'm sticking out and, and some ways that I, might not be beneficial. Yeah. How did it's you, completely different. It's a completely different beast. Yeah. How did you unlearn some things? Like, um, you know, really watching and respecting the kids. Mm -hmm. I think that like, we have a really big problem in that we as a society as a world, I think this is it's not just us, I think this is just always the way is that we only think that we can learn from our elders, people really don't have enough respect for um, learning from everybody and mm -hmm. learning from those who are coming up and who are younger. And, you know, I, I have as much to take from Gen Z as I do from uh, you know, the boomers. Mm -hmm. um, and so really just lo looking at what they're doing and respect with respect, not disdain and trying to learn from it. And also trying to understand, this is what is um, common with, with what we do in television and what I'm doing is really trying to understand your audience. Mm -hmm. That's something that I've always done. You know, you can't serve an audience if you don't understand them. Mm -hmm. And so that's really big for me is like reading the comments, responding to them, like really trying to understand, following other people who are doing similar things, like really trying to understand my audience so I can be of service. Mm -hmm. And just kind of to that vein, like I've, I've taken classes about like marketing and all these things. Cause I'm like, all right, now I'm in this whole new space. It's one thing to do a job under the umbrella of a big organization. Yeah. And then when you go out on your own, you're, a, you're your own business. Yeah. And then you also don't have the platform or the name of the organization behind you that mm -hmm. kind of precedes you. But I mean, you are on network, so you do have name recognition. How did you navigate that space, though, as a businesswoman? It's phenomenally, phenomenally difficult to cut through the noise. And the conclusion that I came to is I don't want to do it alone um, because it's just too hard. And I'm not someone who shies away from challenges. It's too hard to the point where it's statistically improbable. Mm -hmm. And so I'm smart enough to know that I need uh, some cover, you know, mm -hmm. organizationally. And so my goal now and what I do almost exclusively is partner with um, bigger organizations and outlets. So I just finished um, a project with NPR that I'm really, really proud of. So it allowed, and I had creative control, um, I had editorial control, worked with an amazing team that was already in place, really proud of what we created um, and, and they were fantastic. But understanding how hard it is to cut through the noise by yourself. Um, and so that was a big lesson because I'm like, I'm going to go out here, I'm going to be Mara Inc. And I'm going to, you know, take over the world. And it doesn't work that way. It's just really, really hard.
Yeah, I know you were saying um, in another interview how a lot of things that have come um, to you in this season have been because of the relationships that you've cultivated over the years. 100%. What does the pitch look like? Are you coming up with the ideas or are they saying, hey, we've got this thing going on and we think that you it would be in great alignment you know, with what you're already doing? Yeah, um, it's a little bit of a combination of both. So I'm trying to think of the things that came from me. So for example, like my podcast that I I had for two seasons with iHeart did very well. The Trend Reporter um, went to number one on iTunes twice. Um, Great, like really engaged audience. I loved doing it. Um, They, so I had a relationship with someone who then was starting with iHeart and they said, Hey, we're looking for women's lifestyle programming. Do you have any pitches? And I did like, I had like the pitch deck was ready. She was on the deck, you know, I'm like, yes, this is a show I've been meaning to do. And I sent it to her and it was, you know, seamless. We just got it off the ground immediately. Um, And then other things people will come to me and sometimes I'm, you know, I'm, I consider myself very much a producer talent. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like to kind of just show up and read prompter, so to speak. So, but sometimes I'm asked to do that and I'll do that. I'm, you know, I'm good at that. Um, I'm happy to do it, mm-hmm. but I much prefer when I have some creative input um, and some editorial control. And so those are the projects that I really love where I can. Um, and that's what I'm doing with revolt, you know, is the, the, I'm the global news anchor, but I'm also the managing editor. Right. And, um, um, that's really, really fulfilling to me. Did you ever, did you feel like there were skills that you needed to cultivate to uh, best position yourself in this moment? Uh, spiritual and personal skills. Yes. Mm-hmm. 100%. Which, this has been, is the spiritual growth that was missing for me. And I, I see now how the lessons I've learned, the things that I didn't know, they were actually really hurting me professionally in the past. Um, and so I needed to go through um, this period of spiritual growth. You know, there was, everything changed for me. Everything in life changed for me when I surrendered completely to the will of the universe, Mm -hmm. completely. And it was almost in a like defiance, like bratty, like crossing my arms and like, well, I'm fine. I'm not going to do anything. You do everything. Like if the things I'm doing aren't working, then hmm, like you take the wheel, Mm. Um, which is probably not the spirit that God wanted it in. But... (laughs) Look, he will meet you where you are, right? <laughs> so, um, but I surrendered truly and completely 110%. I was not holding on to anything. The only thing to this day that I hold on, and I pray to God I never have to be challenged on this, is the health and safety of my children. Other than that, even my own health, I'm like, okay, do whatever you want, God. Like, you're in charge, you're leading, you're driving, I'm in the passenger seat. Where you go, I'll go and I'll do what you want me to do. And I completely surrendered. And um, I did not do anything without consulting the creator and my ancestors. Not one thing. Wow. And if the answer was no, then the answer was no. It didn't matter what I wanted. And if the answer was yes, then I did it joyfully. And everything changed after that. What does um, hearing the answer or getting the answer um how does that manifest for you? It's funny because it's not ambiguous at all. Mm. It is clear as day. And the times when it's not clear, I have learned, and I'm certain of this, the answer is wait. And so if I'm asking for an answer and I do not get a very clear yes or no, then I know the answer is wait. And I wait. Wow. Was there a moment that that, that thrust you into that crossroads where you said you were kind of having you know, telling God, whatever. I think you just have to really be broken. Like you really have to be broken. And, you know, COVID did that for me. COVID broke me because I'm a very social person. Um, My coping mechanism in life with stress um, for the last 15 years has been exercise. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of obsessed with exercise classes, you know, with the soul cycles and the boot camps and Mm -hmm. the yoga. And so that, that was my way of dealing with life. Um, And so to be isolated and to not have access to really physical activity or community or the energy of the city I live in, um, it it was really hard. I know it was different for different people. Mm -hmm. For me, it was really devastating. And then both of my parents died. And Uh so I went through this period of just, you know, being hit over the head over and over and Mm. over and over again. And every time I would try to get up from the mat, life would come and just smack me back down. And I got to the point where I said, like, fine, I'll just lay here until you tell me to get up. (laughs) 
<laughs> right, 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 right. I'm so sorry to hear that. I knew about your mom, but I didn't know about your dad. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got that. tired of, you know, putting bad news out there. So I did. A lot of people don't know that my father passed mm-hmm. um, because I was like, you know what? I'm tired of these woe is me so Instagram posts. So I'm just going to keep this one to myself. Mm-hmm. Wow. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank I'm you. Sorry, but I'm, I'm glad that you are you know, you're creating a new normal for yourself because there's that's never anything that you get over, right? It's something that you mm-hmm. learn how to live with. So yeah, yeah. And it's and it's again, to the spiritual point, um, you know, my mother, especially I'm very spiritually connected to so mm-hmm. it is tapping into connections with those who are not here physically anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's just a that's a different muscle. Oh, yeah, it's such it's so powerful. It's yeah. so powerful. Um, Gosh, that that I I didn't anticipate that. So that's you know that's thank you so much for sharing. I think that's really important. How would you compare um, how it is right now, like post surrender, right, um, to before? I don't know how you would characterize before, but before, before was the exact you, opposite. One eighty. Yeah, I'm yeah. in charge. I'm in control. Everything. Iron grip. I'm mm-hmm. doing this. I don't care what you want. I'm doing it. 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 That was before. <laughs> but, but, but how's how has that changed your quality of life post surrender? Oh, know? it's amazing. Because life's, you know, you know? life's still lives, you know. Life's so. still lives, you know. Life's still lives for sure. I realized that, and I and I'm not speaking from a Christian point of view, but I I was I, in. I don't want to get too deep into religion. I do mm-hmm. not consider myself a Christian um, in terms of religion, but I I am very much a student of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. and so I'm realizing that so many of the lessons in the Bible. Is, they're not saying do this because God wants you to do it. They're saying do this because it's best for you. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, fool, I'm telling you to do this because it will make your life better, not because I'm going to be offended or yeah. I'm going to punish you. Right. And right. so I just realized that all the things the Bible says about surrendering, about trusting, that is, makes my life easier and my yeah. life better. Like, do not worry. Do the birds worry about what they're going to do? Yes. Do the lilies in the field worry about things? No, God takes care of them. Yeah. And that's really my experience. It feels like all the weight of the world has been lifted off my shoulder. I don't have to do it. Mm-hmm. You're going to do it. So do it. And and I trust whatever you decide is fine. And I don't have to do it. Mm-hmm. And that's amazing. It feels amazing. Yeah. No, when I... um quit my job, I quit without anything lined up. Um, And in fact, it came after I had applied for something else and I didn't get it. And then the company was kind of, and it wasn't in news, but the company was kind of not great, let's say, Mm -hmm. right? You know, in terms of how they handle it, it was just kind of rude. And so I was just like, you know what? Because I was waiting to have something before I left something. And then I'm like, I'm putting everything in somebody else's hands, like mm. another person's hands. And I'm like waiting, saying my joy is going to be incumbent on somebody else telling me yes. Meanwhile, I'm deteriorating on the inside. Right. right. And so right. I just was like, I had to pull the trigger and then came in right here in my apartment. And I said, you just going to have to figure it out then. Right. I don't <laughs> exactly. know. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> you just going to have to figure it out because I'm, right. I'm too through. Yes. I, yes. I've, I've thought about it. I've done the mental gymnastics. I can't mm-hmm. make it math. Yeah. You just going to have to do it. Yeah. And it's been, and, and it's been fine. Yeah. It's a beautiful place to realize that we don't really have control over very much anyway. Yeah. It's mostly an illusion. Yes. That's what another uh, guest said, that used that same word, an illusion. Mm-hmm. I want to go back just really quickly about all of your uh, beauty and all of it. Like, y'all, if you have not checked it out, <laughs> <laughs> I watch those videos on repeat. I'm like, uh, and then what did she do? And what did she do next? Right. What did she do next? <laughs> How did she do that? How did she do that with her hair? How did she know to do that? Um, are you going to go deeper in this beauty space? Yeah, I'm all in because, you know, now I'm I'm free. I've freed myself and I'm having fun. And that's really what it's about for me is this is my joy. This has always been my joy. And what I'm realizing is that, you know, life is is a, the, the point is, I mean, we were saying before we like, uh, you know, started the episode, like, is this all there is? And what I've come to realize, and it might sound depressing, but I've come to take it the opposite way is that, yeah, this is all there is. This is all there is. You wake up, you do the laundry, you take care of the kids, you do the work, you, and, and then you rinse and repeat, and that's it. And so 
I have to find joy in, in like day to day. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go on vacation and then I'm going to enjoy myself. No, it has to be built into my life. Mm. And this is my joy. And so I'm having a lot of fun and I'm having so much fun in the community because this is like girl time. It's like a sleepover, like a slumber party times a million, you know, in the comments. And I love it. It's just, it's such a joy for me. So I'm relaunching my YouTube um, and I'm just posting a lot more content. Um, And I really do, like, I also very much have a heart of service. So Mm -hmm. for me, it's like, it's not like, ooh, look at all the cool things I can do. It's like, no, um, let me show you how you can do it. Cause right. you know, are you okay, you wanted to do a long braid and it took me like two weeks to figure it out. I'm like, hey, I got the long braid. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> you will get some hair. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I, I'm ready for Mara products. I'm ready for all the things. Listen, let's speak it into existence. A hundred percent. All right, we're going to switch gears now to a segment called Act Up and Act Is. Mm. Those are my initials. And if somebody's feeling the friction right now in their body and their mind and their heart, uh, what do you tell them are some tangible steps they can take right now um, to get to kind of where their heart is telling them they need to go? Oof, I would say you have to you have to ask. And this is, I, I have to credit Queen of Fua with this. If you are not familiar with Queen of Fua, look at her up on social media. She is a beautiful spiritual teacher. Um, and she told me this. Mm-hmm. You have to ask, you have to listen, and then you have to act. And I think that we tend to overthink things Mm -hmm. and you have to ask the universe, like, what is my next step? And it will be clear. It will be, and it won't be like, send me a sign. If you want me to do this, let thunder roar in the next 10, 20 minutes. It won't be like that. It will be clear in your heart. If you just sit quietly with the intention of seeking an answer and listening and just wait for an answer. And if you don't get it, it means wait some more. And when you do get it, then act, then just put, and you don't have to, you know, as Martin Luther King said, you don't have to see the whole stairway to take one step, Mm -hmm. just take one step and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. It's okay if, if, if all you see is darkness ahead, as long as you can see one step in front of you, you're good to go. Yeah. I love that. What, when you look back at your journey, what makes you proud like what of yourself? What what makes you proud of yourself? I'm really proud that I've always bet on me. And I'm really proud that I never believed the people who were trying to make me small. I always saw their game for what it was. I always knew they were trying to keep me small because my power was intimidating. And I never for one second questioned who I was, what I was capable of, my abilities, uh, my power, never. And I'm really, really grateful for that, um, that, that, you know, God put that in me. Um, and I'm really proud of that it, mm-hmm. it, to be a black girl and to, to stand up against all the ways they try to destroy us and tear all us the down ways. and make us feel small and insignificant and less than to have to stand up against that day after day, after day, after day for years mm-hmm. and to stand in defiance and in power. I'm really proud of that. Yeah. And it's been proud, like it's been like a source of pride for me to watch it from the outside because your actions and your moves have shown that you haven't let the system break you down. And you've been so generous, so generous. I mean, like over and above generous things you did not have to. Um, You've inconvenienced yourself. And I just feel so grateful. I'm grateful. Oh, thank Mara. you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I, I'm paying it forward. There were so many who did it for me. Um, and, you know, so many that we don't even know, right? You know, yeah. they, I, I do think a lot about the ancestors since my mother passed. Um, and there's so much that I do for my children that will impact their children and their children's children. And they'll never meet me. And I think about all of the things that my ancestors did that have gotten me to this place and I don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's just paying forward and, you know, trying to operate in love and sisterhood. Um, I'm all about black women. I love the world. I love everybody, but I can only focus on so much. So (laughs) 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 me too. Mara, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on.